he actually built the Lander Analytics server from scratch. So with that, Jared, join us. All right, hi folks. You saw me earlier. Uh, I'm here to talk about GIS and R, particularly how I'm going to use geographic information systems. So to do that, we have to talk about maps. And yes, I know this is a globe, but we are going to flatten it out into a map, and we're going to project it downward, and we'll look at it in a 2D surface. And when you're talking about GIS, it's all about relations. And these are relations between points, lines, and polygons, and their multi-versions. Multi-lines, multi-points, multi-polygons. It's all about how they relate to each other. So today's goals, we're going to do a number of things today. We are going to draw maps with different packages. We are going to compute relations specifically between points and polygons. And we are going to solve a fun mapping puzzle. So let's start with maps. We're going to make maps with a bunch of different packages. To do that, we need data. And for our data, we're going to look at City Bike, because we all know how much I love talking about the city. We're going to make specifically two types of maps, plotting actual individual City Bike stations and making heat maps for counts of stations in different neighborhoods. So first up, we need the City Bike data. Now, this data is old. The system is actually much bigger now than it was when I pulled this data. So don't just go by this, but it's good for example. And the data came as a plain old CSV. Latitude and longitude were stored as columns. So I need to read it in. Then I need to convert it to an SF object. And I never remember, is it longitude and latitude or latitude and longitude? So I try both ways and plot it and see if I'm in the middle of the ocean or see if I'm in New York City. <laughs> and we set the CRS to be 4326 to tell it that we're using lat long. And this is what it looks like. It's an SF object, which is essentially a tibble with more information. It tells us that there are 813 features. And it took me forever to realize that a feature is not a column, but it's a row. And 18 fields, that made sense that that would be a column. We get a bounding box, which is the rectangle that fits all the data. And the geodetic CRS is WGS84, which is just lat long, which we already said earlier, they just use different names. Now, it's a tibble, so we're not seeing all the columns. So if I select just a few columns, the geometry column, whether it's called geometry or not, always gets selected along. It's sticky. So even though you can see I use a regular D plier select, it included the geometry column for me. That's our station data. We also need New York City neighborhood data. And a lot of people think New York City neighborhoods can be controversial, like does Chelsea stop at 6th Avenue or 5th Avenue? There's debate. There is no debate. New York City tells us exactly where neighborhoods start and stop. <laughs> they provide this as a GeoJSON file, which means that all the geometric information is already in there. We don't need to convert it to SF. We use the read SF function to read it in. This can read in shape files, GeoJSON, other files, even database connections. And here is our neighborhood file. You'll see before our geometry was point geometry, is individual points on a map. Here there are multi polygons. A multi polygon is when you could have two disjoint polygons that are one unit. That's why it's called a multi polygon. But for the most part, they're probably regular polygons with like a few multi polygons. So first, we will plot using base plotting and the SF package. And if you just say plot of docs, it makes a separate plot for each column of data. It gets the x and y from the geometry column, and then color codes it according to a specific column. And it makes a small multiple for free. You don't need to do anything cool. But if we just want a plain, simple x, y plot, we just selected the geometry column, and we get this dot matrix plot. Cool, looks nice. You can tell it's Manhattan and Brooklyn and Queens and some other stuff we'll talk about. Um, but let's say we want to plot this on top of our neighborhoods. Well, first, we plot the neighborhoods by taking our NYC data, getting the geometry column, plotting it. And then we call plot on top of the docs. And we say add equals true. This is base graphics that's adding a layer on top of the previous existing plot. And we're, color, and we're just setting the color to be blue. And you can see all these dots across the Hudson River, that's Jersey City, because they expanded the program a few years ago into Jersey. We could do more of base plotting, but we won't, because we'll turn straight to ggplot, the old standby that can plot anything. So first up, we're just going to plot the dots. And we see here, we call ggplot, give it the uh, SF object. Then we say geom SF. It automatically knows, go to the geometry column and plot whatever it is. If it's points, draw points. If it's a polygon, draw polygons. It does it all automatically. And I'm using chord SF just to make the boundaries look right. And you can vaguely make out New York City here. But I want to plot this on top of the neighborhoods like I just did. So we're going to just add another layer here. And we will say geom SF twice. 
The first time we say data equals the NYC data, that gives us the neighborhoods, the polygons. And the second time we say GeomSF, which uses the default docs from the ggplot call. Now it looks a lot nicer, but it does still look like it's from the 80s. We will fix that in a little bit, but before we can fix that, we have to answer the question, how many docs are in each neighborhood? This has many steps to it. We first need to do a spatial join to figure out which docs are in which neighborhoods. We then need to just compute a count of each neighborhood and then create a plot, which is a choropleth. So first, the spatial join, which docs are in which neighborhoods. So we take the docs data frame, we select a, a couple columns out of there, and then we ST join it into the NYC data set. This is a special type of join. It is when one of the row of the left table matches one row of the right table based on a spatial relationship. We can define that spatial relationship with the join column. Here I'm using ST intersects, which is sort of a catch-all. If the point is touching the polygon, if the point is overlapping the polygon, if the point is crossing the polygon, is that there's any sort of like physical relationship with them, it captures it. And I'm doing left equals false, because I don't want a left join, I want an inner join, so I'm only getting docs that are represented in New York City neighborhoods to get rid of all the ones in Jersey. So this is what it looks like. Since we joined it on the docs data frame on the left, we have the geometry points from there. And you can see we now have each neighborhood each doc is in. So now I want to do a count, so I just use regular D plier code, and I first drop the, drop the geometry because things go faster, then I just do count of the neighborhood name, and then I right join it back into the NYC data so I can have this count column joined in with the polygon data. And we see it right here, we see that there are 22 docs in Astoria, 23 in Battery Park, 21 in Bedford, so on and so forth. It's one row per neighborhood. So let's plot it with ggplot. We call yet again GeomSF, but this time we passed it a polygon SF that has a count column, and we say AES fill equals N, the count column, and it colors it for us. Jersey City is gone, and we see that lighter blue means more docs. That's awesome. But I want to move on to other ways to map, and we have two more methods. The first is going to be tmap. We're getting a little fancier here. With tmap, you pass the SF object to TM shape. That defines the layer that you'll be working with, and since I want to draw dots, I then call TM dots. And this plots the geometry column as dots. If I want the neighborhoods, I call TM shape of the neighborhood data set, and then TM polygons. I then change the layer with TM shape again to use docs, and plot TM dots to get the dots on top of the polygons. You build it up iteratively, much like ggplot. And if you want a choropleth, you do TM shape of another data frame, and you again do TM, poly uh, TM polygons, but you say call for color equals the column N in quotes, and that colors it in for you. But I want to turn to my favorite mapping package, Leaflet. TM, TM plot can do interactive, but Leaflet excels at it. I'm, much, I'm a much bigger fan of Leaflet. So with Leaflet, you say Leaflet, and here I'm giving it an element ID. You don't need to do that interactively, but if you're using R Markdown, it makes things a lot better. I say add tiles, and that gives me this background, the base plot. It looks like Google Maps, but it's actually OpenStreetMaps. And you could zoom in, you can pan around. I won't, but it's on my website. You could click and drag around. And add circles. I say data equals docs. If I pass it an SF object, it just knows how to get latitude and longitude, and it plots it. If you want the polygons underneath the dots, you say add polygons, give it the polygon data frame. Then add circles, give it the dots data frame. And you can see here I added an argument, pop-up equals tilde and t name. If you click on a polygon, it pops up with a neighborhood name. Same with the circles. If you click a circle, it pops up with a station name. You do tilde bear column name. So the problem with using Leaflet generally is that it doesn't scale to large data. So we have LeafGL. This uses WebGL. And when you do that, you can plot hundreds of thousands of points in a few seconds. Here, I did the same thing. Instead of add polygons, I did add GL polygons. Now, the problem with add GL polygons, it doesn't like multi-polygons. So you need to cast it into a regular polygon first. And now when you do the pop-up, there's no consistency. You no longer do tilde column name. You give the column name in quotes, because different people wrote different packages, and they have no consistency. But it's nice. It gets the job done. Let's go ahead and plot a choropleth. If I use regular leaflet, I have to first create a color palette by mapping it to the domain of the counts, and then I have to call add polygons and say fill color. It's a whole thing. I don't like it. It's a huge pain. I'm just going to skip this slide and move on to a better slide, OK? 
Before I get it to the embedder thing, though, I said, well, maybe I could zoom in on the plot. And you zoom in by saying set view. I say set view, give it the center of the view with longitude and latitude, and I set my view, my zoom at 11. The default is 10, it can go from 1 to 15. This is a little bit easier to read, but it's still hard to read that choropleth, right? It's hard to make out the colors, it's a little too busy. So I thought, well, let's change the base map. By changing the base map from OpenStreetMaps to CartoDB Voyager, it's a little simpler, the background is a little plainer. And the way I did that was I switched from add tiles to add provider tiles. Now, the version of Leaflet on CRAN does not work with Quarto. So I had to go make a pull request, which has not been reviewed yet, to fix it and tell it where to download JavaScript files. It works. Hopefully, it'll get merged into CRAN, or hopefully, Quarto will get fixed, or one of the others. But you can see it's a little bit simpler of a map here. It's still hard to read, right? And I still have to define the palette myself. So I'm going to turn back to Leaf GL. When you use Leaf GL and use Add GL Polygons, you give it the column you want to control the color as a quote, as in quotes, and it figures out the color palette for you. And in my opinion, is using much more attractive colors than the one I had selected earlier. Yes, I selected the colors before, and I chose poorly. Add GL Polygons chose wisely. And I think this is much easier to read. I am much happier about this. And if you want to add points on top of a choropleth, you just say add GL points on top of the previously existing polygons. And that's it. You build it up iteratively, layer by layer, just like you would ggplot. So far, I've been making my choropleths by neighborhood, which are these arbitrarily defined boundaries based on some bureaucrat in the city. So instead, I want to use hex bins. I want to bin up my data into small hexagons and plot the density of those hexagons. Now, the question is, how do I get these points into hexagons? Thankfully, there is a system called H3 put up by Uber, which is exposed to us by the H3 JSR package. And this maps any point on the Earth to a hexagon. And the map is, and the whole Earth has been mapped to 15 layers of hexagons, from really, really tiny to really, really big. So all I have to do is give it my geometry column, and it maps it to an H3. It gives me a specific H3 index. And then I'm able to convert that H3 index back into a polygon. So now I can make a choropleth based on the polygons. I simply do a, a count on that, and it tells me everything. I'm all done. How nice and simple is that? I know I went through the slide really quickly, but the code's all up there. You can check it out. Nice, easy way to do it, and it's really big help having these H3 hexagons. That has managed to compute my GIS processing when I'm actually doing real statistics on this by about 100-fold in speed. It's made a big difference. And Leaflet has all sorts of other cool features we could take a look at. Right here, I added just a few things. You'll notice in the top upper right corner, there's a little measuring tool. If you click that, it's an interactive tool where you can measure the distance between different points on the map. You can even make a little polygon and measure the distance between the polygons. On the upper left, I added a logo. And then you'll see this function, at add mouse coordinates. You can't see it here, but if I were to move my mouse around on there, it would show you the latitude and longitude of wherever your mouse is pointing. But let's say you don't want this boring map as your background. You want a satellite view. Well, we use add provider tiles yet again. And this time, I'm saying use Esri world imagery, which provides 15 layers of zoom of satellite imagery of the Earth. But you'll notice I also have Carto DB up there. And there's a radio button. I'm able to flip between the different maps. If I click that radio button, I can switch to OpenStreetMaps or back to Esri Satellite View. I can also f turn on and off my docks points or my hexagons. I have now allowed the user to have full control over their map and say, take away this layer, switch to this map. All this control, all of just a few lines of code, so simple for me to make. So that has a lot of lines to make different plots. So far, we've done the spatial join. We have made a bunch of different plots. So now it's time to play a game. And when I finished the talk, I actually wrote my talk ahead of time about a month ago. The most popular game going around was Wordle. No, you can't play Wordle GIS, but you can play Wordle. <laughs> this is a Wordle clone where they show you the outline of a country, and you have to guess what the country is. And every time you get a wrong guess, they tell you the distance to the correct country. And it's measured from the center of the wrong guess to the center of the correct country. And they tell you which direction, generally north, east, or south, or southwest. They give you the general direction of where you're going. So I have no clue what country this is. So I just started guessing. Iceland. I was 13,000 kilometers away. Sierra Leone, 7,000 kilometers. 
Lesotho, 3,000 kilometers. I'm getting closer, but I can't find this place. I have no clue where it is. So I said, you know what? I'm going to triangulate this. So I obviously put the data into a, a tibble in R. And then what I said I had to do is I need to find the centers of these countries. Because remember, Wordle tells you the distance from center to center. So I pull out R natural earth, which provides polygons for every country on Earth. Right? I make sure it's an SF object, because it comes as an SP, which is the old way of doing GIS and R. I transform it into lat long. Then I interjoin with my three guesses just to get the three of them. And then I find the centers of those three countries by calling ST centroid. And that gives me the centers of those countries. And I can plot them on a map. And I plotted both the polygon of the countries and the centers. And if you were to zoom in on this map, you'll see that the polygons don't exactly match OpenStreetMap. They're using different boundaries for the countries, which, by the way, is a huge problem when you're doing GIS. If you think, oh, look at this point. That's outside, outside the maritime borders for a country, but it's really inside those maritime borders. That's an international incident. So you've got to be kind of careful with this stuff. All right, so our goal now is to triangulate. The idea is we take each of these dots and we draw a circle of the given radius around them. And where those three circles intersect is our correct country, right? So I draw a buffer around each of these countries. I have the distances in kilometers, so I multiply it by 1,000 to get meters, and I pass that to ST buffer. Now, in the past, if you wanted to draw a buffer around a polygon, you needed to make a projection, a local projection, into a meters projection, because latitude and longitude is angles from around the Earth, and it messes things up. But thanks to Google, we have spherical geometry. And we have the S2 package, which is turned on by default by SF now. So when I say, give me a buffer of, th of 13,000 kilometers, it gives me a 13,000 kilometer circle around that point. I don't need to worry about projections anymore. This is groundbreaking. But when you call ST buffer, it actually gives you a filled in circle. I want the outside of the circle, so I cast it to a line string, which just gives me the ring, the outside of the circle. And when I plot this, I get this. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking those don't look like circles. That's because of the shape of the Earth. You see, the blue circle looks like a circle, right? The yellow one is elongated because the Earth is a sphere. It's a bad sphere, right? But let's talk about that purple circle. That's around Iceland. Now, remember, Iceland, I was 13,000 kilometers away, and it's near the pole. So that horizontal line in the back, that's actually not on the front of the globe. That's going around the back of the globe but we're just not plotting it well. So we can ignore that, all right? Just ignore that little thing. Don't pay attention to that. Now, theoretically, where our three circles intersect, that's our answer. I could have just zoomed in and found my place, but no, I want to do the math. So I take my circles and I call ST intersection. That tells me all the points where these circles intersect. And remember, by triangulation, Two circles will intersect in two places, but three circles will only intersect in that one place, assuming they all have different radii, right? So I filter, again, a regular d plier verb, and I filter in uh, when there's only three overlaps or more. And I get this location, 3.48, negative 54.73. That's my location. So let's plot it and see what's there. When you plot that, I had to add tiles. It's ocean. I then added my circles for overlaps, and it was so tiny, this little place, I had to create, had to create a 100-kilometer search buffer around this thing because I couldn't find it. It was Bouvet Island. <laughs> it is so small, it is not in natural Earth. They don't keep track of it. So I said, what is on this island? So I switched to satellite view. There's nothing there. It is an uninhabited nature reserve in the middle of the South Atlantic, owned by Norway. I don't know how it got there, but it's there. I don't know why that's in the game. I don't even know how they got it in the game. But if it wasn't for GIS and triangulation, I would have failed that day and it would have broke my streak. <laughs> so thanks to mapping and GIS, I got it. So we did a lot of stuff really fast today. We did a lot of different things. So just to, what we learned today, we learned about SF objects are just tibbles of extra geometry information. And the SF package has almost all the GIS operations you want, but there's more operations in LWGOM and H3JSR and GeoDist and other packages as well. STJoin is the real workhorse of spatial analytics. You're always doing spatial joins all the time. It's really powerful. And you can make maps with ggplot2 or tmap or my favorite leaflet. 
And it's all about finding these relationships between the points, lines, and polygons. It's all points, lines, and polygons and how they go together. So thank you very much.